For three conventions in a row now, Federalists pushing the proposed U.S. Constitution had been put on the back foot. They were forced to compromise in Massachusetts, they had to retreat from New Hampshire, and they were decisively defeated in Rhode Island. They needed a win. Fortunately, up next was Maryland. If you remember, when Maryland has come up in the story so far, it has in large part been pro-reform. It had actually been the last holdout to ratify the Articles of Confederation, only finally begrudgingly ratifying them in the face of a British invasion. And in the context of the Constitution, it had almost everything Maryland wanted. Let's take a look at the major points. The Constitution would make it easier for the states to cooperate with each other. Maryland had been working with Virginia to build a canal between the Potomac and Ohio rivers, an idea that was to this point basically held together by George Washington himself, who had taken personal interest in the project. A more powerful federal government might be beneficial to a project like this. The Constitution would make it easier for states to trade with each other. I'd say generally, the Constitution supporters were found in three places. By water, in cities, and near state borders. Now, just look at how Maryland is shaped. The Articles of Confederation left the state squeezed between its neighbors that it could not trade with, despite its access to the Chesapeake and Potomac. Protections for slavery. Most people opposed to the Constitution were afraid that new powers granted to the federal government could lead to the power of the states being overshadowed. However, if you were a slave state, your influence in the federal government would be artificially inflated due to the three-fifths clause. Under the Constitution, Maryland's 100,000 non-voting enslaved people would let the slaveholding ruling class put their finger on the scale in the House of Representatives, as well as the Electoral College. So despite new powers that would worry some, Maryland's interests would be secured. All that being said, the debates in Maryland were not unanimous. Luther Martin was one of the most outspoken critics of the Constitution during the convention. After the New Jersey plan was abandoned in favor of the Connecticut Compromise, Martin and fellow critic John Mercer had left the convention early in protest. Luther Martin took it a step further and leaked to the press that the convention was creating a new document to replace the Articles of Confederation, breaking the vow of secrecy that the delegates had taken. Unfortunately for Martin and Mercer, they failed to generate any meaningful opposition to the Constitution. When a ratifying convention at Annapolis was called, Opponents of the Constitution were very apathetic at the polls. When electing delegates, Federalists ran unopposed in three-quarters of all the races, and voter turnout was only about a quarter of eligible voters. Federalists entered the convention with a huge majority. When an opponent of the Constitution named William Paca arrived, he tried to propose amendments, but was ruled out of order by the Federalists. Maryland was silencing the opposition like the Pennsylvania Convention had. With full control of the convention, the delegates breezed through the debates in just a few days, and then prepared a vote on ratification. 63 delegates voted in favor, 11 delegates were opposed. Maryland became the seventh state to ratify the Constitution. But surprisingly, the convention continued for a bit after the vote was taken. Paca again addressed the delegates. He had voted for the Constitution, surprisingly, and like the rest of the Maryland Federalists, he recognized that it was a better system than they currently had, but he nonetheless proposed that they could perfect the Constitution by amending it, the way Massachusetts had. The Federalists had already voted to ratify, so they saw no harm in drafting some recommendations. A committee approved 13 of Paca's amendments and rejected 15. He wanted freedom of the press, trial by jury in civil cases, and protections for all state powers that were not explicitly given to Congress, among other things. Of the 15 rejected amendments, he wanted them to at least consider three more. Suddenly, the convention's opinion turned on him. They were already humoring the opposition by letting Paca propose a few of his amendments. But if he was going to push his luck, they were going to give him zero amendments. The Federalists said that they were scrapping all of the amendments and voted to adjourn. The vote passed, but suddenly the opposition grew to 27, over double the number that had voted against ratification. A group of delegates who considered themselves Federalists wanted amendments, but the majority had shot them down. Unhappy with how the convention turned out, the minority published all 28 of their amendments, as well as a description of how they were shot down after at first enjoying broad support. This wasn't as circulated or as influential as the dissent of the Pennsylvania minority, but it was used as yet another situation where the Federalists were mistreating the opposition. This was also the second time where a convention had approved extra amendments to the Constitution, at least briefly. This could be a problem down the line. But that was a problem for later. 
Only two more states were needed before the Constitution would go into effect. South Carolina was up next.